Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second in a, our series on critical minerals, um, a series of webinars that we've been doing with the support of the Japanese Foreign Ministry of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the first took place about two weeks ago and focused on the investment needs and the challenges to uh, increasing the you know, raising the investment that is needed to support um, critical mineral supply in, uh, increases. And today we will focus on the nexus between critical mineral security and environmental, social and governance concerns. So we'll begin with opening remarks. Um, and I'll turn it now to Mr. Astushi Taketani, who is the deputy, who is deputy director general at the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Please, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a great honor and a pleasure uh, for me to give an opening remark uh, for this webinar. Uh, this IEA webinar is the second of a two-part event uh, funded by us, Japanese government. I would like to thank the IEA Secretariat, uh, which has made this event possible with a tremendous efforts. At the same time, I'd also like to thank all the participants and speakers uh, who participated in this or uh, in your busy schedule. I really appreciate that. Actually, uh, as countries are uh, embarked on the uh, journey for uh, decarbonization, we will surely uh, need uh, more uh, um, supply for the critical minerals. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Therefore, it's really crucial to secure the steady supply. At the same time, we need to achieve a uh, responsible and sustainable uh, supply uh, for the uh, uh, critical minerals. So uh, this is the uh, theme of today's webinar. So I really hope we will have the fruitful discussion on this matter. It's quite apparent that we should uh, stick uh, to high ESG standards uh, in research-rich countries. Such standards will surely attract long-term investment uh, from the uh, uh, international community, so uh, it will surely help the business sustainability and eventually lead to the robustness of the supply chain. But at the same time, some of the developing countries or resource-rich countries encounter difficulties or challenges uh, because of the uh, uh, capacity limits. So uh, it's really difficult for them to implement uh, high ESG standards. Therefore, it's really important or crucial to disseminate ESG-related knowledge uh, to uh, these countries. And the Japanese government uh, is already making efforts in these fields. I'd like to point out four examples that Japanese governments are making. First, we are the member of the uh, Mineral Security Partnership, MOP, a multilateral effort to enforce supply security of critical minerals. This partnership at uh, its principal meeting last February introduced ESC criteria uh, for responsible critical mineral supply chains. So uh, that's a huge achievement coming from the MSP partnership. Secondly, at the G7 Hiroshima summit, uh, we hosted uh, the summit last May. At the summit, G7 leaders strong sent a uh, clear message to the global community. They affirmed that it's crucial to secure benefits uh, for our local communities, including residents, and protect workers' rights through strong ESG standards. At the same time, they emphasized it, the importance of establishing sustainable and resilient supply chains for critical minerals. Uh, the third achievement, Japan has recently started uh, the Partnership for Resilience and Inclusive Supply Chain Enforcement. This initiative is called RISE, and uh, this is a multilateral finance framework built on the outcomes of Hiroshima Summit. This work will foster sustainable progress via the diversification and high value added of industri industries in developing countries by financing the programs for processing, production, and manufacturing of critical minerals in accordance with higher ESD standards. 
So uh, we need to finance uh, these projects with high standards uh, with rights partnership. Finally, uh, we are a member of the IEF Critical Minerals Working Party, CMWP. This working party is uh, embarking for the uh, formulating policy recommendation to identify uh, the rules and principles of uh, ESG criteria. We hope the IEA uh, will uh, keep its excellent work to come up with uh, the basis for the necessary uh, rulemaking. The IEA held the uh, summit uh, in September, emphasizing the adherence to the high ESG standards, and uh, we should create incentives for sustainable and responsive production. Uh, I thought that one of the takeaways of the last webinar, uh, which happened uh, two weeks ago, was that we need to uh, have the uh, critical mineral traceability with a new set of uh, certification system. So uh, in today's seminar as well, I hope that uh, we would have the another uh, important suggestions as well. We are really hoping that. So uh, I need to conclude my remarks. So the, as a conclusion, I really hope that participants will have the fruitful discussion uh, through the open and candid uh, manner. The private sector may have had uh, the experiences to overcome the obstacles in the pursuit of the resilience and sustainable supply chain. Such experiences should be widely shared, I believe, and uh, I think uh, this is uh, this webinar is the best one to share such experiences. I sincerely hope that uh, we we'll have a big success uh, in this webinar, and we'd like to share uh, the knowledge uh, through this seminar. Thank you for your attention, and I really hope uh, this uh, webinar uh, will become a, a great success. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for these welcome remarks, Mr. Takatani. Uh, I think we'll be, these are some very wise words that we will, that will feed into this discussion. So from for the remainder of this webinar, we will do very briefly a short presentation of some upcoming work that the IEA has been doing on this topic, on, on the nexus between ESG and critical minerals. And then we will have a panel discussion that we'll, we'll turn to immediately after. So if I'll just take one second to share my, to share the slides. So um, as we've already, as many of us already know, and as the IEA has discussed in previous, in our previous reporting and analysis, there will be growing pressure to develop new supplies uh, to support clean energy transitions. This can mean new mines, new processing facilities, new refineries, uh, as well as new investments in circularity um, and other secondary supplies. And this growing pressure will bring increased pressure also on, on the environment, on workers, communities, indigenous peoples, and on societies. So the first and foremost reason to take these concerns seriously is to protect people, communities, and the environment. Uh, fundamentally, it's the right thing to do. And you know, there's no going around the fact that this is, a, you know, this is important to protect people. But at the same time, and in addition, there are important security of supply benefits as well from, from having greater efforts on the ESG concerns of mining. And this is because ESG failures can lead to a whole bunch of different risks that can discourage supply. They can discourage investment in buyers, increase the likelihood of local conflicts uh, and protests from various stakeholders uh, around mines, as well as cause acute supply disruptions when there are instances of, say, of corruption, um, environmental failings, et cetera. And altogether, these failures can slow progress on climate change. They can limit the amount of supply that's available for clean energy technologies like electric vehicles, uh, solar panels, wind turbines, and, and make it more difficult for us to meet the already ambitious goals that we have. So, we at the IEA are currently working on a new report that analyzes and goes into a bit more depth on the nexus between critical mineral security and 
uh, environmental, social, and governance concerns. We're planning to release this um, next month on the 14th of December. And from that analysis, uh, we have developed five key policy levers that governments can use to improve ESG performance across the critical mineral sector. So the, the first is to ensure that legal and regulatory protections um, exist and are adequately enforced and are up to date. The second is to channel public spending and public investment, not just to encourage development of new supplies, but to ensure that any new supplies and existing supplies adopt better environmental, social, and governance practices, and also to, to encourage the, the industry and the market to reward good performance. The third topic is to, or the third policy lever is to strengthen the collection and reporting of data. This can enable progress tracking across the industry. It can also help industry demonstrate who is doing better, uh, which can also lead to improvements and also make it easier for governments to channel investment towards high performing companies. The fourth area is around supply chain transparency. Uh, governments have been looking at this issue for a long time and the, the role of supply chain due diligence, but there's still a need for greater investments in transparency throughout the supply chain, including a, a range of issues, including due diligence mechanisms, improving traceability, and public reporting on risks and mitigation actions that companies are taking. And finally, governments can also support the development of initiatives that can help companies demonstrate that their operations are sustainable and responsible. So these are things like environment and sustainability standards. Um, we, have, uh, we have Michelle uh, Brulart today with us from the Copper Mark, but there are other standards as well from the IRNA um, uh, towards sustainable mining and others. And there's a lot that governments can do to support the development of these initiatives that can be complementary to legal and regulatory protections. Also in this report, we've taken a deep dive on six key risks that can impact the availability of supply. These range across all three of the ESG, environmental, social, and governance concerns. So we've looked at water, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, as well as human rights, corruption and community engagement. And community engagement also includes not just local communities, but also engagement with indigenous peoples. And that's not to say that other risks don't have supply security implications. Um, it's just that we have selected this group of six as priority topics following a series of conversations and discussions that we've had with various industry, government, and civil society stakeholders. So I won't go fully into the detail, but just to provide a bit of a teaser, a bit of a flavor for the findings of, of, what, of what we've done in these various deep dives, looking first at greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, although many companies have emissions reduction targets and net zero targets, so far we have, there is a lack of demonstrable progress on greenhouse gas emissions on, on an industry-wide basis. Some companies have started to make progress, individual sites, but across the industry, we're not, we haven't yet seen significant process, progress on GHG emissions. And this highlights one of the key conclusions of our report on data. Right now, progress track, tracking is quite limited by the available data and governments and companies can do more to ensure that that data is publicly available to allow us to understand both the greenhouse gas emissions of individual supply chains across an individual supply chain, but also progress across the industry as a whole. Looking briefly at corruption, we see that this is a major concern among investors as it raises increased risks, uh, increase the cost of capital, potential for legal liability and, and other things, and can introduce significant delays depending on the level of corruption in the, the supply chain. So obviously this is a multifaceted issue that doesn't have a simple solution. But at the same time, it deserves much more attention than it's gotten in, um, in recent years and in recent discussions. And a more focused effort on transparency, particularly in accordance with the principles of the EITI standard, could bring some improvements. But there's also a need for, for companies to consider their practices as well. And in the interest of time, we won't go through all of them, but just wanted to give a bit of a flavor for the kinds of recommendations we've made. 
for each of the four sessions or each of the six topics, we're walking through what governments can do across the, the, the different policy actions available. That's in, you know, on the regulatory side, on supporting standards, on supply chain transparency, um, on data. And so what we have here is on, on water, just as an example, some things that governments can do is to ensure that public investments or public procurements are conditional on certain progress or certain benchmarks or the suppliers meeting certain criteria on water stewardship and also addressing um, water performance metrics. On the community side, governments can ensure that regulations require companies to identify, engage, and include local communities, indigenous peoples, and other relevant stakeholders in mineral development decisions. And of course, looking at free prior and informed consent where that applies. Um, on the human rights side, governments can promote supply chain transparency by implementing requirements that essentially have to enforce or require companies to embed human rights risks within to due diligence systems. And on biodiversity, there's also a lot that can be done to mainstream provisions on direct biodiversity into mining codes and regulations and ensure there's adequate compliance. I just wanted to say that these are not meant to be exclusive. And in fact, the idea of making, for example, public investment decisions critical or conditioned on performance metrics can apply to all of these areas. And what we do in the report is we explore exactly what are the, the potential options and where are the, the best you know, the next steps for governments. And with that, I will stop the screen share and we will move to our panel discussion. And we have four distinguished panels with us, panelists with us today. So I'll just introduce them very briefly right now and then we'll go to them one by one for some introductory remarks and then we'll open it up for questions and answer and have a bit of a discussion. So first we have Elizabeth Kaysens who is the founder and executive director of Resource Matters. Then we will hear from Stefan De Bruyne, who is the Director of external affairs, of external affairs at SQM. And then we have Andrew Jacob, who is the Manager of Sustainability Standards for BHP. And then we'll go to Michelle Bruart, who is the Executive Director of the Copper Market. And with that, uh, Elizabeth, please go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Um, so in my uh, presentation, I would like to focus on what I would call the ugly duckling in the field of uh, ESG, and that's the G, uh, the G of governance. Uh, I think it was just mentioned in, in the introduction, it's often um, the topic that um, investors are both really concerned about, uh, but what we have seen is that they um, typically have a hard time knowing how to deal with it. Um, and, that's, and that's unfortunate because if um, I look at the experience looking at um, the country that I know best, which is the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's also the issue um, where we've seen the most threats to mineral uh, supply security. It's really a risk that um, that you know threatens um, that might actually disrupt disrupt production, um, disrupt development, um, and so um, we'd like to shed a bit more light on on that. Um, so when we think of corruption, it's really this toxic friendship um, between companies and state officials who favor their um, own interests at the expense of, of the public good. Um, and often it's also um, practices that favor um, quick wins over stable operations. Um, and so if you look at Congo, for instance, I think everyone knows, um, very, very rich uh, country, you name a natural resource, there's a very good chance that Congo has some of it or even a lot of it in high grades. Um, and when we think specifically of the energy transition, uh, Congo right now is the third copper producer on the planet and by far the most important cobalt producer, which is a mineral that's really essential for the battery technology. So it's really a country that is at the heart of, of, of the energy transition when it comes to supply. And when you look at those numbers, when you think of these numbers, you know, third copper producer and, and, and by far the, the world's biggest cobalt producer, that sounds quite stable, but as soon as you scratch beneath the first surface, you see a lot of drama and, and disruptions. Um, I'll give one example um, of about a decade ago, there was this Canadian company developing a really important copper and cobalt asset. The plant was under construction, the pipes needed connecting, but you could see it was almost done. Um, and yet over a you know, series of dramatic uh, events, the company was eventually forced out of the country on very questionable grounds. 
and handed over, the, the project was handed over to a highly controversial middleman, or very close to the president, who then sold it on to a Kazakh company uh, for a massive profit. That middleman has since been sanctioned for corruption in the United States, but the launch of production for that project was delayed by six years um, as a result of this whole um, drama. And that's just one example, there's, there's many others. Now, th the problem with corruption is that it's highly addictive. Um, once you start dealing in bribes, you create bribe addicts that will want more after the first bribe. And so that's an additional risk. And I think, again, going back to Congo, there's a, another Western company that learned this really in the hard way. When they got into Congo, they saw no problem dealing with this middleman that I just mentioned, even though there were all kinds of red flags of corruption. Now, more than, you know, over the, over the first decade that they were present in, in the DRC, they paid more than a, million, a billion dollars to this middleman, you know, and they were, he was achieving all kinds of magic, but they were really turning a blind eye to the fact that he was super close to the president and most likely using some of that money to bribe the political elite. Now, a bit later, this middleman gets sanctioned in the US and then the company decides to stop making payments, at least to try making, um, to stop paying. And when the next thing you know, so they stop paying, the next thing you know, they face all kinds of problems in the DRC. And they basically risk losing their minds. Lawsuits, threats of expropriation, of dissolving a joint venture. And concretely, that means that suddenly a quarter of the world's cobalt supply is under threat. Um, so eventually they decided to keep paying this middleman in euro instead of, of, of US dollars. Uh, but they have faced all kinds of anti-corruption lawsuits in different jurisdictions across the world since then. And so this is what I call the cocaine effect of corruption. If you're going to start acting as a dealer in these countries, then you shouldn't be surprised that you're creating junkies who will basically come after you if you stop providing fresh supplies of bribes. We see the same development now playing out in, in Congo's lithium sector. Just for reference, there's no single ton of lithium that's been shipped out of Congo so far, uh, even though there's an incredibly rich, rich deposit um, about 400 kilometers north of the copper and cobalt sector, but there are already all kinds of investors um, and shareholders who are in fights with each other, four or five different lawsuits over one single deposit, because everyone basically has their own local allies. And so there's lawsuits in provincial courts and national courts and international arbitration. And the result of this is basically that these lithium deposits right now don't have a, a bright future. And that right now they've been blocked for several years and companies that haven't done the work to get an expo exploitation license are getting an exploitation license. And those have done that have done more work and that are actually more in line with the legal criteria to get an exploitation license are blocked. And so despite this really mur murky situation in the lithium sector, we already see global international players of the energy transition asking few questions about all those red flags and lining up to sign offtake agreements. But the question is, how secure are these offtake agreements? How secure will that supply be? And so I think I'd like to, to come up with a, a number of recommendations on how to better deal with this. Um, I think the, the first one is at the international political level. And there's a bit of a trend, and that's both in the West and in the East, and you know it's not really tied to a specific uh, geopolitical faction, but that is to support leaders in these kind of countries that are considered allies, and they're not really supported for their, their amazing governance track record for the G, let alone you know, for their popularity or for their trust among their people. They're supported on the basis of the assumption that they will give access to resources and that they can be convinced with arguments uh, that don't necessarily guarantee the best outcome for their country. But the problem is that you may have other actors that come with stronger arguments and that might actually create disruption for the investment that you thought you had just secured. So that's the first thing is for international political players, allies, partners, partner countries to, to make sure that this topic is um, taken into account. And the second one is for regulators worldwide um, to not drop the G in their ESG standards, because that's something that we're seeing right now. Uh, if you look, for instance, at the EU battery regulation, you know, you use control F and you look for the word corruption, it will show up once in 130 pages. You look at environment, it, fe it features 109 times, right? So same thing in strategic partnerships that are seeing the daylight now, please make sure that the G does not get dropped in the standards. The third thing is for mining companies themselves to stop thinking that this is the only way of doing business in these high-risk 
jurisdictions. We see that that's a trend. You know, there's often the, this thought, well, that's the only way of being present in this country, but I'm not convinced that that's the case. If you adopt a model that's really based on extractivism, where you ship, ship out as much as you can, as fast as you can, while leaving nothing for the communities around, you will not have the local um, support and local network that you need to be protected against corruption. But if your model is one of long-term value addition, local transformation of the minerals, investing in the energy supply, not only for your own minerals, but also for the communities around it, you get vested interests among local politicians, among national politicians who will have a much harder time um, to, kick you, to kick you out basically and, and, and have come up with these requests. And the last thing that I would like to say is for the supply chain actors, um, what we've seen right now is that corruption is a bit the elephant in the room. No one really knows how to deal with it. And so there's often, you know, when we ask questions about high level risk, corruption risk, the answer is often our supply chain is so complex and we don't really know how to deal with this. The OECD has, has come up with a guide on, on how to better address um, these specific issues. But we see now that, you know, there's other excuse, excuses that come up. And we really would like to encourage supply chain actors to ask the right questions. When you face a red flag of corruption, ask your supplier, how it can be sure that it is not paying politicians, that it is not engaging in bribery, um, that has the right to audit suspicious transactions and so on. Make sure to ask those questions because down the line, it might threaten your supply. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much for that very interesting intervention. I'll now turn the floor to Stefan to please give his presentation. My screen is coming through. Yes, we see your slides. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm uh, I joined Eskim in 2005, um, and I was responsible for the sales in Asia Pacific for more than 12 years. Um, so I've seen the change in the lithium um, demand, uh, live uh, and direct. Um, I think it's a very interesting uh, case study, and so I'll try to shed some light uh, on what SQM is doing uh, towards um, all the challenges that uh, Elizabeth has mentioned. So before I start, I want to quickly zoom out. Um, I think it's important to, to talk about ESG in, in mining. But I think it's equally important not to forget um, all the fossil mining that we are doing since many decades. I think we are a fossil uh, society. Um, and as most people on the planet, uh, I'm also addicted to fossils. Um, but I would like to, to change that. And what you see here in this graph, um, in the colored boxes, is the cumulative demand uh, for transition minerals and metals. And in the back, in gray, you have one year uh, mining volume of coal. So we're talking of a different scale of magnitude and we're talking of a very different business proposition because the only way that the mining of the transition minerals and metals can be sustainable is if we are ultimately recycling them and putting them back into the loop. Um, so I think this is a very important mission um, that everybody in the value chain needs to, to take on board. And so um, jumping now from the broad um, overview, into the lithium production. So if you look globally, um, most of the lithium today is mined actually more than half in Australia. Um, but those lithium concentrates are today uh, exported to China where they are refined. Uh, there is three major refinery projects also locally in uh, Australia. One of them is an SQM joint venture. Um, so to, to change uh, that situation. Um, but the second country in the world uh, where lithium is produced is Chile, uh, responsible for about 27-28% of lithium chemical supply last year. And all that lithium is coming from uh, one salt flat. Um, in our opinion, it's the best lithium salt flat in the world. It's also one of the biggest lithium salt flats uh, in the world. And so you can see here on the, the left of the picture, um, SQM's evaporation ponds. Um, and then um, there is some dots that are highlighting some very important uh, local stakeholders. So if you look at the orange dots, those are five indigenous communities that live on the side um, of the Andes mountain. And so they rely on surface water coming down 
And then the blue dots, you can see that are downstream, are SQM's uh, water wells. Um, and, and I think I took this slide to really highlight the, the dilemma that we face here, because on, on one side, you have a mining company, we're operating a government concession. Um, so it's a public-private partnership. But on the other hand, you have uh, local uh, indigenous people, and they have a very different cosmovision um, than uh, the mining company, SQM, or the government. Um, their cosmovision is to live with what the earth naturally offers to you, and that means not drilling for water, and it also means not drilling uh, for brine or, or mining. And so that is a huge dilemma. And then the question and the case study, of course, is about how do you handle um, this dilemma and, and this fundamental uh, difference of opinions? So first and foremost, I think, and it's been mentioned uh, in the previous talks, transparency is, is really key. Um, in 2020, we made all the data for our environmental monitoring uh, network publicly available to all stakeholders. Um, there's more than 225 uh, hydrogeological measuring points, but also there is uh, biotic monitoring. So it's a very robust environmental monitoring system, and it's open to all stakeholders to look at what are the brine levels in the operating area, in the marginal zone, which is a protected area, and what are the levels of the freshwater aquifers on the eastern border of the solar. That is not enough. Um, we are the biggest lithium producer in the world, and so um, that is a result of our leadership strategy. Um, around 2016, 17, 18, we decided that our strategy needed updating. Um, and so we included sustainability as, as an important attribute of, of leadership in, in the value chain. And of course, it's very easy to set an ambition and to have a vision to become the most sustainable lithium producer. The question is, what do you do about that? And then you have to look at things very holistically and you have to, very, to take very dedicated action. I will not uh, dive into everything, um, but I do want to say that we have set um, ambitious uh, goals. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you some results um, already of, of those goals. Um, and I'll start immediately with, with water. So we set ourselves a target to reduce water company-wide uh, by with 65% by 2040. But specifically for Salar de Atacama, we wanted to reduce by 50% um, before 2030. And um, actually, we have already achieved that ambition. So if you look at the last three years of operation, we are now down more than 50% below our allowed extraction uh, limits, which in prior years we, we did uh, use. If you look at brine, and I know this is very counterintuitive, but these are facts. So we have reduced the absolute extraction of brine by 23% um, compared to our allowed extraction rate. At the same time, if you look at our refinery, which is in Antofagasta by the Pacific Ocean, um, there we are quadrupling our output. And we're doing that because the resource gives us this flexibility, but also because of uh, innovations and because of the targets that we have set ourselves and changes uh, to our um, business strategy. If you combine those um, and you look at the perceived water intensity, um, this is where you abandon life cycle assessment and you look at how stakeholders perceive this, we have actually reduced uh, the perceived water intensity by two thirds in the last um, four years. Um, I've shown you all the, the initiatives we've taken. We're very encouraged that also now the leading ESG rating companies in the world recognize uh, that we are a leader in this aspect. And I want to draw you to the picture on the left, um, where you see the, the very recent update of SMP Global's Sustainability Yearbook. This is a very comprehensive assessment. And we are very proud that there actually SQM has reached 91. And this is the industry maximum score. So it shows that we're very, very focused on this. Um, and this is also confirmed by the Refinitiv uh, analysis, which also ranks us as one of the top companies in the world. Um, Regarding standards um, and, and really having independently audit that you're doing things according to uh, the book, and that's on E, S, and G, and also leaving positive legacies. We are the first lithium site to achieve IRMA 75 level, um, and we're very proud of that. This was the result of, of more than three years of intense work uh, throughout the organization and also outside organization with stakeholders. Um, why did we choose IRMA? Because um, 
actually it's a choice that we didn't make alone it's a standard that is supported by um worker union organizations by affected communities but also by investors uh, by our customers by the value chain and also by uh, civil society that's not to say it's a perfect standard what but we believe that it is uh, going very strongly in in that direction to meeting all the requirements that are um, demanded from us um i leave the link here to a german study uh, which compares mining standards i know often people say this is very confusing and there's too many standards um and that i think is believe because many standards were initially started as material specific standards we chose a material agnostic standard which we believe is the most comprehensive and the most rigorous mining assurance standard in the world today Final point uh, of my presentation, uh, there was also a lot of uh, comments about value sharing and local transformation. Uh, we are producing battery grades, lithium carbonate and lithium uh, hydroxide locally in Chile um, to the highest standards used uh, by cathode producers and battery producers worldwide uh, without any transformers in between. Um, the Salar de Atacama is also the lithium mining site with by far the highest value sharing um, of lithium in the world. Specifically for SQM last year, under the lease agreement with the Chilean government, we contributed close to $3.3 billion. Um, we are also a Chilean uh, company, so we pay Chilean corporate taxes, uh, which last year amounted to one point seven billion dollar overall five billion dollar um so i think um it's very clear to to say that chile is a, a country that has managed uh, this um very well um it's also an oecd member country it's in the top uh, quartile of uh, rule of law in the world and so i think uh this is an example but saying that immediately i also think of immediately all the things that we have left to do because there's a lot of work left to be done on the ground in engagement and um in responding to all um the demands that are raised by stakeholders and so that is what drives and motivates us uh, every day thank you very much wonderful thank you stefan for that that presentation um, we'll now turn to Andrew Jacob from BHP, but I'll just note to the participants, please feel free to send your questions using the Q&A feature of Zoom, and we will come to them after the session, or after the discussion. Andrew, please. Look, thank, thanks to the IA and the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan for today. Uh, I can certainly resonate with Takatani-san's opening comments that the, the private sector should share its learnings, and I'll try to do some of that today, focused on the topic of ESG standards. More specifically, though, I, I would like to share our reflections on three things. Um, really, the role of ESG performance standards in the context of the energy transition, key barriers limiting the effectiveness of standards today, and opportunities to lift the impact of standards for the benefit of, of everyone. So we believe that in any plausible 1.5 degree scenario, the industry has to both grow rapidly and produce responsibly at the same time. If set up effectively, ESG performance standards have a major role to play in supporting a responsible energy transition by lifting ESG performance and transparency across the global mineral supply chain. By standards, I'm, I'm referring here mostly to responsible production standards set up by organizations such as the Copper Mark towards sustainable mining and the International Council for Mining and Metals, to name just a few. Um, and, and for us, there's, there's many reasons why the engagement in and the adoption of these standards is very important. Firstly, by engaging in the development of STEMs, we have an opportunity as a 138-year-old company to contribute learnings, working together with the multi-stakeholder community to inform industry better practices and help lift performance across the industry. Secondly, by aligning our management systems with industry better practices, it supports our ability to proactively manage ESG risks as well as ESG opportunities. Thirdly, independent verification against credible standards by no means perfect is the most objective measure today to report on the ESG performance of a mining operation. So by making performance and actions more transparent, it can support trust with a broad and diverse set of stakeholders. And finally, where we can meet or exceed the expectations of those stakeholders, it can directionally support us to be a supplier, buyer, partner, and employer of choice. Now, while standards present great promise, uh, there remain some barriers to their effectiveness today. And I'm, I'm going to share just two of them. The first is, perhaps unsurprisingly, proliferation. Uh, despite often originating from positive intent, the proliferation of ESG standards and initiatives across the globe has generated unnecessarily high levels of complexity to interpret and implement. 
It's also hampered stakeholders' ability to make meaningful comparisons between organizations. And that complexity tends to be further elevated by content within standards, which can carry ambiguity, leading to varying interpretations and lengthy lead times to implement. Simply put, the world has too many standards today, and we see the growing risk of this distracting rather than enabling the industry to focus on the actions that matter the most. We would define the second challenge as fragmented expectations. Many performance standards have transitioned from being voluntary to being a firm expectation from customers, commodity exchanges, industry associations, and even regulation. However, we see varying knowledge and expectations on standards across the multi-stakeholder universe, often nuanced by commodity, downstream market, and jurisdiction. And while credible standards exist today, there is currently no single best standard, as each has its own strengths and weaknesses, be that the scope or specific performance criteria, the assurance process, the degree of multi-stakeholder engagement, or the practicality to implement. So the result of these two things, of proliferation and fragmented expectations, means that many organisations today are impelled to adopt many standards, which also means many assurance processes, resulting in high inefficiency, audit fatigue, and an orientation around compliance rather than impact. That being said, we see two clear opportunities to lift the positive impact of standards for everyone. The first is simplification. In order to structurally address proliferation over the mid to long term, we believe that the unification or convergence of major ESG performance standards is necessary. And if done in the right manner, should benefit everyone, society, investors, customers, and other stakeholders. It removes layers of complexity, it enables better comparability of companies, and it provides an opportunity to bring the best of all worlds, combining the currently lean infrastructure across the standards landscape and life cycle, spanning standards development, implementation, assurance, and governance. Convergence also provides an opportunity for better continuity of a responsible framework to build from, and that would provide better stability and confidence for organizations to streamline our internal processes, systems, and, and improvement programs with external standards. And by aligning on a primary responsible production standard, this can create greater headspace to focus on improvements to the sustainability of value chains, extending from responsible production and processing to responsible products and better positioning value chains for a more circular economy. How this is done is also important. Multi-stakeholder participation remains crucial in standards development and governance. At the same time, standards need to be clear, risk-based and practical for the industry to implement, respecting diverse local contexts across our sector. The second opportunity relates to extending this opportunity for simplification into policies and regulations and across all geographies. And there's a there's a few parts to this. But, you know, firstly, where policies and regulations reference responsible production and responsible sourcing, they should leverage credible standards rather than attempt to create a new set of requirements. Secondly, this should not be limited to specific jurisdictions nor specific raw materials, but aim to uncover all types of mining globally. To have real impact, this should be about lifting everyone up, irrespective of whether they present a low ESG risk, like nickel sulfate production in in Australia, or a high ESG risk like nickel laterite production in Indonesia. This would also allow a, a level playing field for the global production of minerals and metals for, for society. So bringing the broader industry up and ingraining continuous improvement means that standards and policies have to be inclusive enough to encourage all types of producers to participate, as well as be sufficiently performance-based such that better ESG performers are differentiated and incentivized to lift higher. Wherever possible, regulation should also meet these objectives subject to jurisdictional constraints. So let me close here with a, a few key messages. You know, standards have the potential to catalyze change across mineral supply chains. And this next period will define whether the status quo of proliferation prevails or whether unification and therefore the opportunity for greater impact prospers. It's important that the right foundations are set now to best position this for the mid to long term. By unifying standards, streamlining policies and regulations and where possible applying this to the industry as a whole, this could significantly lift positive global ESG impact for all types of stakeholders and better support a responsible energy transition. Thank you. We'll now turn to our final panelist, Michelle Gruart, who will, who's from the Copper Mart. Please, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for having me here today. It's, it's a pleasure to be in this conversation. 
always a bit of a challenge to go last um, after a series of, of speakers. Um, if you allow me just to say a word about the copper market itself, uh, we are an assurance framework for responsible production. Um, so we do, and we are one of these standards that um, are being discussed here. Um, our vision is for a sustainable society to be enabled by the responsible production, but also sourcing and recycling of metals. And we work predominantly with copper as well as nickel, zinc, and molybdenum today. Uh, the, the copper mark has been around for a bit more than three years and today covers about 30% of globally mined copper, so not an insignificant volume of the globally mined um, commodity in terms of the copper production. Um, it's been very encouraging to hear the recommendations from the IE around transparency, um, supply chain due diligence, um, and the role of voluntary standards the, the role that they can play in supporting policy and supporting governments when it comes to responsible production. At the same time, as, as has been mentioned um, just now by Andrew, this has become a pretty complex landscape and a, a pretty crowded landscape and companies, both SQM and BHP, as, as we've just seen and heard, are implementing not just one, but really a multitude of different standards. Um, so, you know, what, what do we do? Where do we go from here? Indeed, it's it's really not about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, um, but it's to understand what the role is of these standards, what kind of tool are they, and where do we best use them in the toolbox to achieve responsible, responsibly produced minerals that can support the energy transition. Um, so I wanted to spend my couple of minutes um, reflecting on the types of standards that we have in this crowded landscape and what some of the... Um, aspects are that standards can help to support. So how can we best use them? So I think one thing to acknowledge is that, you know, standards are a great tool to help convene different stakeholders where there is a collective issue that needs to be solved. Um, in particular, where there is a an absence of a defined set of requirements, where there's an absence of a consensus around what is responsible production look like? Um, how do we define that? in a particular sector, in a particular geography, for a particular issue. Um, and so voluntary standards can help drive a shared understanding of what expectations are, not just in one jurisdiction, um, not just in one value chain, but more broadly speaking. And because there is this, this inherent driver around standards to solve a problem as it's being perceived by a number of stakeholders, we typically see standards that are either sort of focused on a specific value chain or a specific sector, um, in this case, mining or value chains of, in our case, copper for other systems, aluminum or steel, for example. Um, we see standards that are more product focused. So a global battery alliance is a great example of that, where there is an issue around in ensuring sustainable value chains with batteries. Um, or we have standards that are more issue focused, so kind of bringing us back to the topic of transparency and governance with the EITI, um, or other standards that are very specifically looking to deep dive and address one particular issue. And so that explains part of the complexity here is that we sort of come at this problem with different stakeholders looking to solve, either looking to deep dive into specific issues or looking to solve an issue in a specific sector or a specific value chain or a specific geography. Um, and that's led to indeed a bit of a mushrooming um, of these different voluntary standards. So, you know, how can they, how are they helpful? Um, why are they still a tool that's being used? Because even though we do hear very frequently um, and very loudly that there is a, a, a complexity in the standards landscape, it's overcrowded, it's becoming too difficult to navigate for the users, both for the users who want to implement the standards and those who want to use the results of the standards. We still see, it feels like almost daily announcements of initiatives, multi-stakeholder initiatives, sustainability initiatives, um, principles that a group of, of companies, a group of stakeholders have agreed to implement. So we still see this as, as a field that's quite dynamic and, and where new initiatives continue to emerge rather than this being sort of a finite state where we can now just focus on consolidation. And so I think a couple of the, the ways in which standards um, help or are able to support moving the industry forward is one by setting the standards. So to my point, sort of creating a shared understanding of what a specific issue, um, how to tackle that, what are the, the basic principles, the performance, the, the practices that we're looking for, and, and how can we make sure that that's agreed 
um, again, not just across a specific national regulatory context, but then how do we make sure that these expectations really translate across a whole industry and a whole sector? Um, and so in that sense, standards are a tool that can help support um, the implementation of policies in the national context. They obviously, they don't, um, they, they, they don't take away the need for a sound policy and sound regulation, but they can support companies in implementing um, practices that will then be aligned with the requirements in different jurisdictions. Um, Andrew also mentioned that independent verification is something that very often accompanies standards. And again, this allows you to have a level of independent third-party verification um, anywhere in the world, really, through these global systems, um, not tied to national inspections or, or the ability of, of national governments to verify practices, which may be um, looking differently and having different outputs in terms of the results that are communicated, etc. So um, voluntary standards do, in, in many instances, provide an opportunity for a independent verification slash assurance process at the site level to be implemented, and then to combine that with an expectation of transparency on the results. So a disclosure of what are the performance levels um, of a specific site against the requirements in that standard, which links back to the recommendation of the need to have more data, more comparability, uh, more information as to how companies and sites are, are really performing in this space that, again, is comparable beyond um, a single sort of geography or, or jurisdiction or sector. Um, so, you know, we're, we're setting expectations with standards. Um, we often have frameworks in place that allow us to monitor and verify adherence and, and implementation. Um, and that is combined with transparency in terms of how that verification is conducted and then the results of that verification in terms of the performance levels. Um, and as I sort of started saying here, the, the one of the key um, aspects of standards is the ability to bring multiple different stakeholders to the table. Now, when we say multi-stakeholder, we, we may have an image of, of what that looks like in terms of different categories, different types of stakeholders being around the table. Um, but sometimes standards can even just be a tool to bring industries to the table, to bring more companies um, more different actors, smaller actors, medium-sized actors to the conversation that would otherwise not have participated. Um, so I think when we say a, a, an ability of a standard to convene different stakeholders, it's not. It, it's great if that is a multi-stakeholder process and that is definitely the, the direction of travel that we are going into. But again, I wouldn't want to discard sort of the single issue standards that you know, really bring together, for example, actors around a very specific topic that needs some focus and that needs to be addressed in more detail, or even standards, again, that are sort of clustered around the value chain or around the specific sector to be able to, to scale our efforts here. Because ultimately, if, if we want to be successful in the energy transition, um, and if that energy transition is to be supported by responsibly produced minerals, we really need to get to scale. We need to be able to go beyond the largest producers, and we need to be able to bring responsible production standards to the broader set of the industry. We need to bring that to new geographies, um, to potential not new minerals in the sense that they weren't in the ground before, but you know minerals where there is a significant growth forecasted. We're going to need to have new players, um, again new geographies in the in the mix here. And so there's a real opportunity for us to convene and to engage with those stakeholders from the beginning, um, without having to kind of go back for decades, but to start where we are today in terms of the understanding of what responsible practices are from the companies that are already implementing these standards, have years of experience in terms of um, implementing and, and demonstrating performance against those standards, so that at the end of the day, we can leapfrog, uh, if that's the right term, with the newer producers and the um, demand that it needs, well, the supply that needs to follow the demand in terms of the energy transition in a way um, that doesn't harm people and the planet. Thank you, Michelle, for that intervention. At this point, we have about 35 minutes where we will have more of an open discussion among the panelists. Um, I see a few questions are coming in on the, the Q&A function, so we will take those in a few minutes, but I want to start with a question of my own. Um, this one is perhaps for primarily for Andrew and perhaps Stefan, but of course, all please feel free to join as you see. Uh, so given the complexities of uh, of demonstrating and improving ESG performance. 
I, we wanted to ask, how does this effort emerge as a business case for companies? So from the company side, where are you seeing the pressure to improve ESG standards? Is it coming from investors? Is it coming from customers, from governments? Just wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, also particularly from Stefan's side, the decision to uh, you know, approach the, the IRMA standard. Uh, that's quite uh, an interesting dynamic we'd like to hear a little bit more about. Maybe Andrew, if you want to start and then we can go to Stefan and then others. Absolutely, great, great question, and 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 probably let, let me just split it into the two parts: one on the business case, and 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 secondly on where the where we see the pressure coming from. Um, so I guess on the business case for us, at its core, we believe that proactively managing ESG risks and opportunities means that we're better positioned to protect and grow our reputation, license to operate, market access, product credentials, and help to attract the best people. Um, at the same time, the value proposition could be stronger in some areas, and we believe, as one example, there, there should be a stronger correlation between objective ESG performance and, and access to capital, uh, um, and we can see that in sort of what, what, what you've touched on also as the IEA. Uh, I, I think ambition levels can also shape the case, right? And, and any company that wants to be an ESG leader in their industry and credibly shape that agenda has to be able to back that up with compelling ESG performance. Uh, and I'd also say that the value proposition on this also extends to an industry level. You know, with better transparency, there's a better opportunity for closing what has traditionally been a wide trust deficit between society and our industry. And I would add here that lifting multi-stakeholder education awareness of programs such as ESG standards is, is also important here. Uh, it, it look into the second part in terms of where the pressure is coming from. Look, it's both external and internal. Uh, externally, I'd say the pressure varies mostly by value chain and geography, as are the types of ESG risks that different stakeholders are focused on. Uh, we'd say downstream pressure is really led by the automotive sector, particularly battery value chains, but other sectors like construction also with steel value chains and big tech with data centers linked to copper value chains are, are also leaning in more. Uh, civil society investors are playing growing roles, as are policymakers through emerging critical minerals acts and the expansion of due diligence regulations. Geographically, Europe is leading the charge, but it can also risk hindering progress if it generates too much complexity. And external competition, of course, also plays a healthy pressure uh, of a role uh, across the industry, with, with some producers clearly accelerating efforts in this space. Internally, uh, in terms of internal pressure, our experience at least has been that our company's purpose, values, strategy, and culture with incentive systems aligned around that provides a, a fairly organic and visceral pressure at all levels of the organization to do things responsibly and continuously improve. Um, as there is external competition, there's also internal competition. You don't want to be the leader of an operation scoring poorly on your ESG audit results. There's a lot of reputation, passion, and pride at stake, and that in itself drives significant pressure. So, so for us, we think it's been probably less of a question on the business case and where we need to get to and, and more about how we and the industry do this in a more effective manner. Um, and the high focus is placed on opportunities such as such as unifying the standards landscape. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Stefan? Yeah, yes. So from our side, we believe the business and the ESG um, interests are, are fully aligned. Um, I'll try to, to give a couple of, of quick examples um, to, to demonstrate that. So um, we started doing life cycle assessment uh, back in 2019, because if you set the goal to be carbon neutral, you need to know where your footprint is coming from um, and you cannot manage what you don't measure. So from that LCA, we saw that um, more than half of our carbon footprint of lithium carbonate is coming from an, an, an input, which is soda ash. Um, so as we had set the goal to become uh, carbon neutral by 2030, then it was up to the engineering teams to, to address that footprint. And so we are now working very intensely on a project to um, produce our own soda ash in-house. Um, and so that's a very exciting project where actually um, the lithium engineers also gave a very good idea to the iodine and the nitrate engineers um, to piggyback off of that. So when when you see that happening, it it really it's something very very strong, and goals can can seem unattainable, um, but when you put people to work, you can really really move things forward. I would say if you look at the um, the stakeholders landscape. We did a human rights participatory due diligence process uh, last year. Um, and you can see that the concerns and the perception uh, about water 
are are very very uh, ingrained in stakeholders and so um based on the outcome of of that um due diligence process we then announced our innovation roadmap for uh, water neutral lithium production where we want to combine the le with uh, seawater adduction desalination and um advanced evaporation technologies um and and that is something that you can see that the interplay with the stakeholders actually helping us to move forward and and um we just announced last week actually that we have now invested 20 percent in a dle technology company in france called adionics and so as an employee uh, of a company it's very exciting to to see those things uh, at play and so to me there is there is no divergence or disalignment between the esg interest and the business interest if if you are a long-term company if you don't tackle this seriously, um, sooner or later, um, it's going to negatively affect your business. Thanks for that, Stefan. Um, I want to come as a want to come as a, a follow up to something that you said, and also brings brings in one of the questions for the floor uh, from the from the Q and A. Stefan, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how the multi-stakeholder process has worked. In particular, the question we have is directed at you, and the question is. What is the most immediate form of communication and transparency with the indigenous locals in, in Atacama? And maybe if you could say a little bit more about how you've approached the issue specifically of uh, indigenous peoples um, and the, the rights associated with that. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a very good question. Um, and, and that immediately, um, and the question mentions uh, some older people don't have access to the internet. Actually, there's local communities that don't have even good cell phone network coverage. So um, I think to me that brings immediately the importance to mind of, of horizontality. And so it's understanding those restrictions um, and then acting towards it. And so um, we are by origin a fertilizer company so um we are fortunate that we have been working for many many years with local communities through agricultural support uh, where our agronomists help uh, local farmers and so we try to continue to to build on that um if you look specifically at the five communities which are to the east of the salar which are in our environmental permit as um defined uh, area of influence we have now uh, agreements with four out of five of those communities, and those um, agreements also include environmental working tables. And um, so what that means is that um, local communities say, hey, you're reporting transparently on your environmental monitoring system, but how do I know that those data are correct? And so with, with those four communities, uh, those environmental working tables, they include joint monitoring. And so people from the local community um, come with us uh, to the, the, the wells, the control wells, to verify that the measurements are uh, correct. Thank you for that. Uh, I, now I have another question from the floor that's on a similar topic that's perhaps, um, I'll direct the question at Michelle, but maybe others can have, uh, might have thoughts. It's a slightly provocative question uh, from Pierre de Pascal, noting that 99% of the responsible mining standards that have, the, that are, you know, that are really originating with the industry. So there's a lot of, at least in historical, most of the standards are coming from the industry. And his question is, what safeguards do you see as critical to not replicate the mistakes of the industry-led initiatives and stakeholders? We've also heard Andrew mention the importance of multi-stakeholder uh, in the involvement in development of standards. So that's what we could start with Michelle as to what you, if you have any thoughts on that. And then Andrew, please feel free to jump in. Uh, or Elizabeth, whoever else. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the question. I mean, I, I maybe will start by saying I don't entirely agree with the assessment of 99% of the standards being just industry development, industry led. Um, but one can debate over that. Um, it, look, I think what we've seen over the past couple of years is really a, a far um, a far more clear definition of what makes a standard credible. Um, there's an increasing set of criteria and requirements, whether that's driven in the EU through regulatory um, developments of, of trying to define what kinds of standards would be accepted or whether that's, you know, increasing numbers of studies, benchmarks, and reports, learnings. I, I think what we're seeing is a clear set of criteria that are coming out to say, if, if you want to have a voluntary standard, there's, you know, three, four, five things that are 
essential for this to be considered credible. Um, these are multi-stakeholder governance, um, so engagement of, you know, and, and in that, I mean, a governance structure that doesn't allow any singular group to unduly influence the process and the outcome. Um, transparency, as I said, in process and the results. So not just publishing audit results, but also being transparent in terms of what are the requirements, how does the process, how does the assurance process work, how are assessors selected, etc. The requirement to have independent and site level verification. And, and this is where, you know, if we look at some of the kind of um, more rating agencies that look at corporate policies, what we're seeing is, is a clear kind of ask to really go site level and, and have that independent verification at that level. Um, and then increasingly sort of grievance management and remedy are other expectations, uh, which are probably slightly less well-defined, but there is an expectation um, for standards also to be able to manage complaints um, through, again, transparent and inclusive mechanisms to, to manage complaints and grievances as they're being raised um, and to either provide or in most cases actually you know, be able to participate in, in remedy where where impacts have been where adverse impacts have occurred and again that's that's something where i think we still need to see more developments and more clarity over what the role of standards and standard systems is so i i think the bear the, the sort of the safeguards are in those criteria and the you know the increasing conversations around what is credible how is that structured how is that managed and organized are really helpful because it it does not only provide more transparency in terms of how these standard setting organizations are managed, um, how these standards are developed and how you know performance against them is, is verified. Um, but I think it also, and this links to the, con the questions I'm seeing around convergence, it provides us with an opportunity for more um, collaboration in the first instance, harmonization, potentially convergence going forward of standards because we're all working towards meeting those same criteria, right? We're all sort of adjusting our processes to meet those same um, expectations around what is a credible standard. And that brings the systems naturally more together. Um, so I think what you're seeing today is, is a result of a, uh, a more clear expression of what a credible standard is, a more clear set of expectations of what a credible standard is. And that helps us really bring standards closer together. And it, it helps us um, engage among standards as well um, to understand where are there further opportunities for us to either, you know, cross recognize each other's results um, or, you know, potentially bring our respective standards closer together. Thanks, Michelle. Perhaps if we could go to Elizabeth, who looked keen to jump in on this topic. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to bounce off the, the idea of a, of a credible standard and the, the idea of um, it being led by the industry or not. Um, I think in the end, a credible standard is the one that has an impact on the ground. Um, and I think we we unfortunately are still very much lagging um, in terms of what we have to show for all the standards that we have, whether they're industry-led um, or multi-stakeholder-led. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been incredibly convincing for communities on the ground. Um, and so again, regardless of, of who's been developing it, I think there's been a, a real problem of, of, of impact. Um, and so the question becomes, why have we waited for so long to take more robust measures in terms of moving beyond the soft law approach? Right now, we do have, again, a fragmented approach at different jurisdictions that are picking up selective issues in selective uh, regulations. But why, for instance, has the OECD, who has really been kind of at the heart of standard setting and to which all the different industries are now aligning or testing their alignment of, of their standards. Why has the OECD not moved forward towards a convention on due diligence and, and, and a real um, more binding um, standard that uh, countries could ratify and, and then implement in their various jurisdictions, which would help us create a, a level playing field that is really much needed. Um, I'll give just one example. You know, the OECD guidance on, on, on due diligence has an important step, which is step five, in terms of public reporting on the due diligence efforts that companies have carried out along their supply chain. I, I would like to see how many companies are really rigorous in publicly reporting on what they have actually done, on trying to disclose you know, who their suppliers are, what the issues are that they have faced with concrete examples, rather than you know, more general, we faced some issues of human rights violations somewhere on a continent. You know, 
where where is that reporting? Where is the public disclosure of of the efforts that have been put into um into into proper proper due diligence that is not a result of international media focusing on an issue, but really a genuine engagement with communities on the ground to see what their uh, key concerns are. Um, I think it's about time for us to to move to the next step and make those disclosures uh, compulsory rather than up to basically good practices or, or, or soft law. Um, one of one of the things we see, for instance, it's an it's an easy answer to um, to to again that for me is is a, is is a testimony to the fact that there's no need to go beyond is for instance oh you know our supply chain is very complex and then we keep it at that and we 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 fail to really uh, be more rigorous in 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 what we're asking from major multinationals who source you know uh, incredible amounts of of minerals it's really up to them to see how far they go in mapping their supply chain. And, and documenting it, and so they can get away with saying it's too complex. So it's you know five steps, uh, five steps remote. So we don't do it. At Resource Matters, we've taken that that argument to the test, and we've actually mapped the cobalt supply chain. I mean, I don't know if there's time to 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 show what we've how far we've gotten, um, but but it's basically again, how is it possible that um, our organization, which is you know an organization nonprofit based on public um, on public report on public available information. We managed to map a supply chain that big multinationals say that they can't map. I'm just getting to the um, to the one second. Let me just show. Oh, second. I'm not sure you can see the screen. Yes, we can see. Let me pull it up. So again, this is like it's right now. All of this is based on. On um, on basically reporting that isn't compulsory. This is us putting together the supply chain of the cobalt of the cobalt sector, mainly focusing on the DRC because that's the country that we know best. And basically, this is what we were able to map based on stock reports, news reports, news articles. Basically, ninety five percent of the information that's on this on this um, on this map um, is is publicly available. But there's no compulsory, you know disclosure requirements. So we can do this for cobalt because that's an issue that that's a, a mineral that's been a lot in the media, a lot in, in, you know, there's been a lot of attention to selective issues in that sector. And so as a result, companies have become a bit more transparent in disclosing who they who they source from and actually saying, oh, we source from industrial mining, therefore there is no problem. Again, this problem of selectivity. Um, and yet, and yet if we want to do the same with lithium, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get so far because there's maybe been a bit less attention uh, to that mineral or to nickel or to mag magnesium. So that's, I think if we manage to get a compulsory standard that requires this kind of disclosure, we would be able to carry out more proper due diligence across different minerals, regardless of which kind of uh, specific topic is in the media. So I'll keep it at that. Thank you, Elizabeth. I mean, we're starting to get into some related questions. Um... We, you know, about the, the what the role of due diligence and the role of traceability, and also how those two things fit together, because they're not necessarily we don't see them as the same thing. Um, and like, what can that play in supply chains, and what can governments do to support that? We've heard a little bit from from Elizabeth just now of more support on the due diligence, potentially the idea of a convention supported by the OECD. Um, there's also just a, one of the comments. Um, in the question box that I that we draw your attention to from from Pierre about some work that the OECD has done in this area, but I just wanted to raise that for 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 all to 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 add to in addition to what Elizabeth has raised. Please, Andrew, go ahead. Yep, I'm ha happy to go ahead with that that question on on due diligence and traceability, uh, and and fully agree that they're, they're, they're different things, um, albeit albeit quite complementary to each other. Um, I, I guess we see due diligence as, as, as a pretty powerful vehicle for, for leverage to lift transparency of ESG risks and, and mineral supply chains and ultimately drive action. Um, I think the good thing is that the industry has a base due diligence framework um, organized around the OECD guidance for minerals, which underpins most standards. Um, the challenge is more that because of standards and arguably regulatory proliferation, the industry needs to integrate varying interpretations of that framework across different standards, auditors, regulators, customers, and and other stakeholders. So again, you know, harmonizing standards, policies, and regulations can can really better empower companies to spend more time capacity building with the mineral supply chain and, and probably less time distracted by by too many audits. 
um, I think with due diligence and, and respecting um, Elizabeth's comments as well, I, I'd say it's, it's just important to stress that aside from conflict minerals, the majority of our industry are still relatively new in, in our due diligence journeys, um, particularly OECD alignment journeys. And meaningful transparency and improvement, particularly with higher risk areas, will, will really come from focused upstream risk-based due diligence, as, as that's where the leverage in, in commercial relationships, relationships typically resides. And, and regulations, particularly from the EU, in conjunction with the UNGPs and OECD guidelines, are understandably expanding the scope of due diligence from, from primary to recycled materials and from human rights to environmental risks. Um, equally, we think it's important that expansions in the scope of due diligence are done in a very clear and considered manner that the industry does not spread itself too thin or lose focus on capacity building against critical risks um, with their mineral supply chains, which requires time and focus. Um, as, as for traceability, uh, I would say regulations across both sides of the Atlantic have really extended from transparency into traceability over recent times with the EU batch of regulation, perhaps the most non-discretionary of those. There's a pretty long journey ahead in, in our view before we see a world with high quality product level ESG data that's scaled industry wide and flowing accessibly along what tends to be pretty long value chains. And we think there's there's a few prerequisites for a successful traceability ecosystem, if we can call it that. Um, I think we, we need to clearly address interoperability between standards, product passports and, and traceability platforms. We know that the traceability ecosystem can't afford to proliferate. It doesn't have the luxury of time for importers to be ready before key uh, regulatory deadlines. I think we also have to respect that the supply market for traceability is still in its formative years, and it's not easy to build sustainable business models with varying motivation levels from actors across the value chain and, and in a high cost of capital environment. And, and our industry could also benefit from learning from more advanced industries on traceability uh, while still adopting fit-for-purpose solutions. And, and look, some of those challenges are already well recognized, and, and we're certainly engaged with broader stakeholder, broader multi-stakeholder communities, I should say, that are, are coming together to try and address those. And, and we know that, you know, pragmatism is going to be pretty important there in particular. I'll just add one final comment, which is, well, I think that that ecosystem needs a lot of maturity. We do think that product traceability, such as uh, Stefan spoke about, about life cycle assessments, has a relatively clearer pathway, um, particularly as an eloquent approach to supporting carbon footprinting and beyond emissions too and is a natural no regret move for companies that can also serve as, as primary data into traceability as well. I might add it on to others to, to make comments. Thanks, Andrew. So Michelle and Stefan both want to come in, but I just wanted to note where we might run out of time on the question. So I'd encourage the panelists to, to look at the Q&A and also if you want to provide any written responses to anything, please feel free to do that. Michelle, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to circle back to Elizabeth's point about the impact, because I think oftentimes we do tend to forget a little bit when we get into traceability discussions, um, why it is that we are asking for traceability. What is the impact we're ultimately trying to achieve here um, on the ground? And I think what we've seen with conflict minerals regulations, for example, is that you know we, we have a risk here of creating paperwork um, for the sake of creating paperwork. And that is not going to drive the impact we're looking for. So that's why, to me, making the distinction and continue to make the distinction between traceability and supply chain due diligence and transparency is really important. I don't think we're going to progress on making the positive impacts we're trying to make or mitigating the negative impacts in some instances without transparency in supply chains being established. But that doesn't necessarily mean we have to have full traceability in every supply chain for every product. Um, I think the starting point has to be to do that mapping exercise, right, to understand the supply chains, if, if you are a customer, if you are a buyer, um, to understand where the material is coming from, because that's going to help you identify where the impacts are, where the negative impacts are, where the opportunities are to create a more positive impact. Um, and so transparency, I think, is a key tool. Um, supply chain mapping, supply chain due diligence are key tools that we need to use there, but I would just caution against the automatic conclusion that traceability is a solution that helps us drive impact in every instance, while it undoubtedly has its 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 benefits and its place in the ecosystem of tools here that we have as well. But I think Andrew did the far better job right now of outlining what some of the challenges are that, that we have there um, in terms of traceability. So I think 
having you know having accompanied companies starting with that frank with conflict minerals back in the days and and you know now today focusing on on copper and other minerals more in implementing supply chain due diligence laws it it does take a while it takes a while for these due diligence expectations to be translated into management systems i think we've come some way um over the past years but again to sort of you know go back to elizabeth's point and and picking up from from pierre in the chat as well there continues to be calls for better disclosure, you know, better public reporting on these elements. Um, and so, again, that goes to the point of, of transparency and being able to have the information that allows us to understand where the where the risks are in the value chain. And so where do we need to focus our efforts to be able to create the impact we're looking for? Thank you, Michelle. Elizabeth, do you want to respond directly to that point? Sorry, Stefan. Yes, just very, very quickly. I don't think my argument was about... Um, setting up traceability schemes. Uh, I don't think that was uh, the core of my point. Uh, the point was actually about transparency and disclosure and making sure that there's much more rigorous reporting on what companies do to ensure that they have carried out due diligence, they have tried to map their supply chain, that they have tried to identify the people-centered problems that, um, that are happening in their supply chain, uh, rather than spend a lot of money on consultants involved in traceability initiatives and all kinds of technological feats, uh, but that really miss um, the impact. So I just really want to clarify um, that that's, my focus was actually on transparency and disclosure, but to make that compulsory rather than um, the current soft law that we have and that has not been effective enough. Stefan, please go ahead. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll address the three topics in, in order. So I think on um, due diligence, um, one of the the strong things about IRMA is that the full audit report um, is publicly available if, as a company, you want to report your score. Um, so that gives a, a very good base document for discussion with, with stakeholders. And of course, it allows you to zoom in on the points where work is left to be done and you don't need to, to discuss things which are uh, already um, up to, to the highest standards. Um, on traceability, I do think that's very important. It's something where a lot of work is, is still being done. Um, but so we are working with Circular um, to provide data throughout the value chain, uh, ultimately uh, to reach the, the final customer. And um, I just wanted to, to mention also, because you also questioned the, the lithium supply chain, Elizabeth, um, the large majority of lithium today is produced in, in OECD countries, at least at, at mining level. Uh, the price boom is now more or less over. So the incentive for artisanal uh, and small scale mining is reducing strongly. Um, but there really, um, you know, we we are accountable and um there is um an, a good example which which i i really love um besides what the value chain itself is doing for instance the french uh, geo survey brgm um wrote a paper on how they can uh, it, individually trace lithium um, to it back to its source because lithium sources are so diverse um, they have a very good uh, view of tracing back the lithium so I think that transparency and that that traceability is is not necessarily the need of an expensive consultant you have other chemical solutions as well um, ultimately we all need to be held accountable um, otherwise stakeholders will will stay with with doubts and so I think that's where we need to work towards Thank you for that. Um, we have about five minutes left. Uh, there's one quite interesting question in the chat that I just wanted to, to see if there are any perspectives on. This is a, the question is essentially about the dynamics between different um, renewable, different clean energy technologies and how they play <laughs> into each other. Specifically, the question of how you know there's substitutability between hydrogen and renewable energy in some places. I just wondered if the, based the question is, is there any danger that the dynamics and competing uses between clean energy technologies may have a negative impact on the kind of improvements of sustainability? Um, maybe there's a particular question for me that this raises on the need for decarbonizing mining operations themselves and like what options are available and how you take into account those, those uh, kind of choices between technologies. If anybody wants to react to that in our last four or five minutes. I maybe have a, a quick comment. Um, of course, um, I'm a, a shameless lithium advocate, 
but I, I think the, the main challenge on hydrogen is, is to get green hydrogen. And, and today we have a minority of hydrogen produced as green hydrogen. Um, so I think we need to solve that, that first before we talk about hydrogen as a competing, uh, technology for, for mobility. Um, when you talk to OEMs today, um, in most use cases of, of light uh, and passenger vehicles, uh, buses, even trucks, um, lithium ion seems to be uh, the most economic. And, and so the, the, the technology of choice going forward, I think we'll need hydrogen uh, in hard to abate uh, carbon intense sectors. Um, and so for me, they are kind of separate because we believe very strongly that, that lithium ion is, is going to be the technology of choice, uh, at least in mobility, uh, but also in energy storage uh, going forward. Thanks for that, Stefan. Uh, unless any others have a comment on, on that point, it does raise for me a related question of, this is not necessarily one for us to answer today, but just for one, just as a point for reflection is how do the ESG impacts of the kind of upstream inputs like all lithium, cobalt, et cetera, how should, how does that and how should that feed into the decisions about what are the choices um, for whether we use electric vehicles or whether we use uh, other um, clean energy technologies. I mean, this is really an interesting thought. Obviously, we have the big piece about climate, but we shouldn't forget that there are, you know, differences between different technologies. So I, anyway, this is really just, it, it also plays into some questions about circularity and how we reuse things. Um, uh, but we, we're kind of running out of time. So if anybody has any thoughts on that, please feel free. Um, but the one... One last comment that I did want to look at, there was a question about working conditions and about how the conditions for workers and safety is addressed in the context of these sustainability questions. When if anybody wants to have one final word in, in one minute on that particular topic, which hasn't yet come up. I, I'm happy to just speak on you know, any, any broader or any comprehensive sustainability standard um, that covers the E, the S and the G will include requirements around working conditions, um, things like labor rights, employment terms, um, work agreements, mechanisms, working hours, occupational health and safety, et cetera, are standard topics to be covered in, in any um, sustainability standard. Again, that isn't single issue focused, but that is comprehensive in its, in its scope. Stefan? If I can maybe quickly comment and, and highlight again, um... Why, why we believe so strongly in IRMA. Um, we have labor unions on the governance board of the IRMA standard. So the standard was designed over a period of more than 10 years. And so it takes this into account. Um, and, and yeah, it, it's a transformational process because you have to look at everything, your supply chain, uh, your, your workers, your environmental management, um, communities, um, how you, you plan for positive negative legacies. All of that is, is considered in the standard um, and is audited and is transparently available in, in the audit report um, for stakeholders to, to look at and, and then um, hopefully reach out to us and, and, and start a conversation. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I just want to thank all of the panelists and also to thank the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Takatani-san for being here with us today and for encouraging this work. This has been a very interesting discussion and debate and I hope we'll continue this. And there's one last question in the chat about what steps could governments and investors take to supersede the need for a business case and mainstream responsible mining across all companies? And I'll just use that as a shameless plug of that's exactly the question we're trying to answer in our report that will be coming out on 14th of December. So please keep an eye out for that. Thank you, everyone.